Well, this is near the end of my stay here. I'll be leaving here on Saturday, and uh, I'll be in Palo Alto until Tuesday, when Davy just told me there's a going to be a polar shift, and particularly affecting all travel eastward. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a very wonderful time for me, and I'm grateful to all of you for helping to make it that way. It was very difficult for me, as you know, but with Craig Roberts' help and with Divine Mother's help, I'm doing much better now. I'm very tired, and uh, that's just something you have to deal with. I was at the um, eye doctor this morning. He sort of did some laser work on my left eye, and they put a little thing on my wrist, and looking at it upside down, I said, oh, I'm only 18. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, I hope to come back for uh, more time next year. We shall see. Um, I've had several questions from people who were startled by something I said in Los Angeles, and I think I perhaps should touch on it again. I told you in the talk in Los Angeles that, uh, and by the way, that was perhaps the most important talk of my life. Launching this book, doing it in Los Angeles, sort of completing a circle, I'm very grateful for it. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I mentioned what the Brigu Sanghita had said and uh, about future troubles. Master talked about that a great deal. It hasn't come yet, but I, all the signs seem to point toward it's happening soon. And I know McIlvaney keeps telling people in his newsletters, and others do also, buy gold. My problem, my thought on that one is you can't eat gold. I think. Um, the most important thing is food, and I would, I, would in, I would encourage you to get ready for it by thinking of planting not only flowers but vegetables. And I know some of you do, and I think it's a very good thing. It's also a good thing to store it, and uh, I believe the company that does that used to be at least in Nevada City, so that's a thought. But what Master said was that Greed is what would cause it. America is becoming more and more greedy. It's really quite alarming to see how much, going down to Los Angeles, you must have felt it. The greed consciousness, greed, uh, I mean by greed, avarice, not food. Although I must say, when I see so many stout people, I wonder if food isn't a part of it. Um, the. What Brigu said was that, uh, well, it was an interesting reading. I got two, and I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about them. I won't say much, but the first one I got was in a town called Barnala. Uh, it was about a, an hour's drive from Patiala, where I was giving lectures and classes in 1959, November. And uh, it... it uh, when I, I'd never heard of Brigu, but in the Bhagavad Gita it says, among saints, I am Brigu. And he's supposed to have written this um, predictions for thousands of people who hadn't yet been born. And uh, the original is supposed to be somewhere buried in Tibet. I don't know much about it. I knew nothing about it when I went there. But it was most intriguing. I don't read Sanskrit, but... Uh, they had uh, um, reading according to questions that were in my mind. And the prasan, which means question, the moment of that, they made a horoscope for. And I and the Raja Marigendra Singh, who was the, one of the sons of the Maharaja Patiala, and the pundit, all three of us, and I saw a horoscope that looked like the one he'd drawn, and that was it. And so he read it, and he spoke about my last life in India and uh, various things. It said that now he is a, a uh, follower of Ashtanga Yoga, that means Patanjali's Yoga, and he's uh, famous and he's touring India, but he's from 
uh, a foreign country, from the, from the West. And uh, so I'm not going to tell all about that, but the interesting thing is then, the one I will talk about is that I was in Delhi the next month and there was another Brigo Pandit. There are different segments of this which are copies of the original, supposedly. And uh, so I went there just out of curiosity and the Pandit um, got a reading for me. And the first one, it said that this is the only one it'll give all, he'll give all day. There are no mother, no, he wouldn't give any others that day. This was a different sort of thing, and it was based more on my horoscope. And it, it spoke about my having lived in India in the days of Kurukshetra. And uh, it said in this life he was born in Romania and grew up in America. And uh, he has brothers, but no living sister is possible, though one will die in his mother's womb. Well, that was intriguing because I had no idea that my mother had ever had a miscarriage, but I asked her when I got home to America, and she said, yes, she'd had one. And so, I suppose, who knows? And uh, it said that his father named him James. Well, my full name is James Donald Walters, but I've always gone by the name Donald, so I don't think anybody in India knew that it was James. And uh, then it said his guru's name was Yogananda, and uh, it said that in two months he will go back to his country and he will be uh, received with love and be given a high position. Well, I had all the position I could have at that time. But on the way home, I got a telegram in Japan telling me that Dr. Lewis had died. So I was put onto the board and made the vice president. I have to, the way I always put it is I was made the token male member of the board. We poor men were definitely second-class citizens. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, that was the start of my undoing, and I'm grateful for it, because here you all are. <laughs> you wouldn't have been, and I wouldn't have been otherwise. Anyway, it spoke about difficulties after that. And <coughs> but it did say, in the future in his country, when there will be weeping in every home, and. Uh, I do think that something very grave is coming. I don't see any reason for weeping. God gives us our tests. But don't imagine that everything is going to be easy. Master himself said that this, there will be a war where no corner of the earth will be safe. I remember a story, which some of you know, about a man in, after the First World War who decided there was bound to be another one, and he didn't want to be around when it happened. So. He searched the globe to find a safe place, and he finally settled in 1938 on the island of Guam. <laughs> so, of course, that was pretty much the center of the Pacific War Theater. But uh, you can't get out of your karma, and it doesn't matter how many lifetimes we've lived. It just, it's nothing to worry about, so you kick off and if you haven't made it, you come back again. I hope I don't have to come back again. And we'll see. If I come back, I hope it'll be to help people, but not to help me. Anyway, the, this is what Master talked about. He said that the depression of the 30s would be, this would be much worse than that. And I believe it. He said the dollar wouldn't be worth the paper it's printed on. And when you hear that they're, uh, I've read that they're printing trillions of dollars every year, it's, it's scary. Sooner or later, the world is starting to turn away from the dollar because it isn't worth what it used to be, and they can't trust it. Well, if they pull out their investment in our dollar, that too will be a cause. And a, a, a depression in America will mean a global depression. It's something to expect. God gives us tests in order to help us to grow. It isn't that God gets angry with people. We draw it on ourselves. But the karma of this world at present is not good. That's why you see so much. I know Pushpa asked me about the drought in England and the floods in England. Well, that's all a part of it. The, the, uh, um, I asked Master about England. He said she's finished. I said, uh, you, 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 
I said, you mean uh, finished, finished, that's the way he put it. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know whether that means it'll be brought, taken under the water. Listen, we've all got to go sometime. So what does it matter if we all go at once or? <laughs> don't be worried about these things, don't have fear. But faith in God is very important. My interest, of course, is the future of Ananda. I believe that communities are a very important answer to this whole thing. Master kept in context with the uh, talk on um, depression, he kept talking about communities and the need to start communities where you can live simply, grow your own food, and uh, live close to nature. I remember, however, in Hollywood Church one Sunday, he paused in the middle of the talk on communities and depression and so on, and he shouted, you don't know what a terrible cataclysm is coming. Now, cataclysm you think of as a, as a natural disaster. Whether he meant it that way or not, I don't know. I know the, the human race will stick around, whether you and I do, who cares? I know, frankly, I'm not at all afraid of death, and in fact, I rather hope it won't be too long. This thing of being over 80 isn't all, all roses. <laughs> but uh, I say, don't be afraid. Put your faith in God. Put your hand in His. He will take care of you. The communities, however, I, this is a very important aspect of the work that Master has given me to do. And I've done something unusual with Ananda. I've made every community autonomous. This was because they were trying to, uh, they were attacking us uh, legally. And I thought, well, let them not be able to go after everything. But I think it's a good thing. It's something I've always envisioned is decentralization. At first, I worried about it because people who um, were separate, how could we decide that we would send somebody there? But we're united in spirit. And I would like to see all our colonies United in spirit, we don't have to have legal um, unity. You know, this thing of headquarters, th thinking that it knows better, is a great delusion. I know my dad was the, the um, oil geologist in southern France when they found oil there, but in the beginning, one of the directors came from New York and just sort of looked at the map and said, why don't you drill there? Uh, of course, that's ridiculous. You have to study everything. and. Uh, in fact, it wasn't there that my father found oil, but they made a stamp to him and gave him the, the Legion of Honor and various things. But it, uh, it's this thought that headquarters knows better. How can they know better than people who are just as dedicated but living in the field? I'm against that idea. And I see it creeps in all too often when you've got this top-down arrangement. We've tried always to keep Ananda, the decisions at Ananda, as much as possible at a grassroots level. Sometimes spiritual decisions I've had to take, sometimes decisions that affect everybody have to be made. But on the whole, people who are involved, if they can do their deciding, I want all of you to feel a sense of responsibility for what you do. One of the problems we have and this is something else that people have written me about in the in questions they asked me, was uh, how do we support ourselves here? You can't really support yourself easily at Ananda today. We, we live on much less than people in the cities, but nonetheless, food costs money, shoes cost money, clothes cost money, everything costs money. I have done my little bit in this respect. I've written that course, um, uh, Material Success Through Yoga Principles, and everybody who's read it is very enthusiastic about it, and I think it can do a lot of good in the business world. Meanwhile, um, we've come up with the idea, I read this in the, uh, in the papers about the Sterling Company in Arizona, and they have come up with solar energy that would be something that they could convert to electricity. And the Southern California Gas and Light Companies, I understand, have ordered these things from them. 
But we, we wrote to them and they said they just didn't have time to do anything more. They had to fill, fulfill the order from Pacific Gas and Electric and so on. And so then Dharana told me that they have, uh, now there's another invention that was made in the early 1800s that when you can have movement from heat to cold, you, it can generate electricity. So then I, I thought, well, I mean, most people think photovoltaics and um, batteries and so on. I have a very simple mind, and so I didn't think that way. But I did remember that, uh, and I think I've told you this, but for those of you who haven't heard it, a time when I was just out of high school, I was just turned 17, and we went to work on a farm upstate New York. And uh, we went to the movies one night, and walking home, we lost our way, and we walked and we walked around four o'clock in the morning. It was so cold, and I just, I realized the ground was cold, but the road, the asphalt road, was still warm. So we lay down on that and got comfortable. There was no traffic at four in the morning in the farm country, but uh, it showed me that some things maintain heat much longer than other things. So based on that principle, we have. Um, been working on this invention of ours, which converts um, solar energy into electricity. And it's looking like it's going to be a great success. Um, they're going to be showing me, I suppose anybody who wants to come, on Friday the prototype for that they've finally been working on for a year and a half. They've, they hope to have it together then up at this meditation retreat. And uh, if this works, it could be a very big thing for us. I hope it does work, and it's looking very promising. We're not using asphalt, though that would be one thing, but we're using canola oil, which also keeps hot much longer than water. And with that, we heat water, and so we generate the uh, turbine and so on to produce the electricity. Anyway, it's looking extremely promising. Meanwhile, there's another invention that they've made in India, which is very good, of wind power. And with just a little bit of wind, it really gives quite a, quite a thrust. They have one up on the roof at 10 by 8, and when people down on the ground don't feel any breeze at all, it's spinning like mad. So we have a number of villages that are already interested in, in uh, getting this, and uh, we're on the eve of a great explosion that way. I think this will bring money to Ananda, and I know that this could be a great boon to many of you. I would like to say that our greatest test could be wealth. Not poverty, but wealth. Poverty we're used to. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, uh, I don't want you to think that, oh, we've got it easy now, why try? But you could get into these businesses, and what I would like and I, know, I understand we do have a um, committee that is trying to think of ways to earn money. If any of you have anything that you'd like to do, if it's a suitable thing and not a butcher shop or something, um, <laughs> then uh, why not? Don't be afraid. We need things to support this community. We're not a community that seeks to live on charity. We want to do, do it ourselves. and. Uh, any of you that, that have worries about this, think seriously. The community itself can't employ everybody. It employs quite a few. But we need to think in terms of income. We need to think some in terms, I mean, don't think that God's just going to do it all. I, I can't tell you how hard I had to work to make Ananda possible. I had to make that money myself. That meant going out and giving yoga classes and um, it was hard work. I went from city to city, night after night. These are things that can make money. You can go out and teach yoga classes. But uh, do things seriously. It's not unspiritual to make money. In fact, Master said something quite interesting. interesting. He said that the ability to make money is the next greatest gift after seeking God. So that's no joke. The ability to take care of yourself, to stand on your own feet, not become greedy, but help other people, 
This is, this is admirable. I used to, I say this with some strength because when I was young, I had no interest in money. And uh, I know my dad when I was 16, maybe I've told you this story, he wanted to buy me a tuxedo. I said, Dad, don't bother, I'll never wear it. In fact, I'm never gonna earn enough money to pay income tax. And it's proof true. I, and <laughs> in college, I wouldn't even sit at the same ta lunch table with the business majors. I just didn't. The, what was a, my surprise when I came to Master and found his most advanced disciple was a millionaire <laughs> businessman. And I've come to realize that that's not unspiritual to be able to earn money to do what you have to do and to help others is a, a very important talent to be unable to do to take care of yourself is not spiritual in the early years at ananda many people thought it was spiritual just to go down to the river and swim and they figured god would take care of them it was particularly annoying for me because i was the instrument of taking care of them <laughs> and i had to go out and work like a dog but gradually it's all worked out and I'm very grateful for it. It's been a very worthwhile thing to do. But I do say, do always keep in mind, no matter what happens, our first rule is seeking God. We're here to seek God. Everything else is secondary. Many times we've had the temptation thrown at us. I can't say I've ever been tempted but to get money in other ways. Like after the fire, there was a great brouhaha here on the ridge when they discovered that the fire in 1976 was caused by a county vehicle. And they said, we can sue and get everything back that we lost. And I said, no, we won't sue. And uh, we could have lost everything. There was nothing to prevent us from losing everything except God's will. But we did come through that test. One time, I'd been here less than a year when somebody came to me, a young man. He said, I've inherited a lot of money and I, I'm sort of torn. Shall I live here or shall I live in India? And I asked him, how much was it? He said, $200,000. That's like a million dollars now. And I said, well, I think you ought to go to India. I wasn't even tempted to say stay here. If he'd stayed with us, we'd have had that money. But I wasn't tempted. Since he sa asked the question in that way, I felt he wasn't strongly desirous of living here. He was split, so I said, go on to India. I don't want anything that isn't given to me by God. And I'm not going to take any such thing as a gift of God unless he proves it to me. And so I have always, and we have always, after that fire, Jyotish said we must pay off the people who lost their homes who want to leave. So we paid them off first. Then we began to rebuild the community. That was an honorable decision. And uh, whereas I sort of gulped at it, I agreed. <laughs> it was right. We must do this always. Always remember, no matter how hard the tests, keep dharma first. Yata dharma tata jaya. Where there is right action there, is victory, success, peace of mind. And I have always made peace of mind my bottom line. I could have gone running in circles to do all the things I've had to do. I've always said I will never do anything that taxes my peace of mind. That has always come first. Make that your priority. Meditate and let God and your appointment with God every day be the most important part of your life. These things are important for the future. I'm not going to be around all that long, but as I look around me, I feel very humbly satisfied to see so many people really in tune and wanting to do Master's will and wanting to do the right thing. I'm proud of this community. I'm very pleased. But I know that you will have tests and I want you always to keep God's and Guru's will above everything else. If you have to be bankrupt, if you have to lose Ananda, somebody asked me the question, if uh, 
the testing years of the 90s when we had all those legal problems, if we weren't tra traumatized, I said no. My thought always was, if God wants Ananda, he'll, ha he'll keep it. If he doesn't, we'll do our best, but if he takes it away, I'm, I'm living to serve him. I'm not living for success. Success has never been my bottom line. Peace of mind is. And when they were attacking me personally, I just thought they can take away everything, but they can never take away my love for God. That's all that matters. After you've gone, the only thing you'll take with you will be that love. Make that the deepest thing in your life. I would like the communities that we have always to be sort of a tightly knit brotherhood. I would like you all to work together, but I know that as the time comes, there will be more and more people wanting to be in communities. We can't, we can't handle all of that. I think we must look upon our work as an inspire, inspirer, a way shower for others. It's not so easy. It's no, it's no joke to lead a community. You have to be people oriented. And that's why one of our principles has always been that people are more important than things. I don't know how many people starting new communities can do that, but I don't think we can have the strength to go out and dilute ourselves by starting hundreds of communities. I do think we can offer them advice. I do think we can offer them a place where they can come and learn how to do it. These are worthwhile things. But to spread ourselves too thin, I think would be a mistake. At the same time, we are in a sense in a state of implosion still. There will come a time when there will be a need for explosion. And it may be that many of you will have to go out. These are things that are in God's hands. I see them as possibilities. I've always worked in terms of directions, never of specific goals, because the opportunities that open are often unexpected. When I got east-west, when we got east-west in Palo Alto, um, Men Menlo Park actually, the Virginia Sharpman, the owner, said, I'm getting old and I'd like to retire. Would you like to buy? this east-west for Ananda. I just for a second paused and meditated and felt yes, and I said yes. Well, I didn't have any money. We didn't have any money, but I just had the confidence that we'd make it. We needed to pay $45,000 down, and uh, that was no joke. But somebody sent us a donation of 37000 in that period, and it all worked out. Now, of course, we have the, the store, and it's been a very major uh, outlet for what we do. Um, I suspect, you know, we joked about the launch in Los Angeles being followed by a lynch. <laughs> I don't think it'll happen that quickly, but I suspect it will happen. You know what Master said in Autobiography of a Yogi? That reason had forsaken him, but he could still shout. And. Reasonable people will read my book, Revelations of Christ, and I think they'll be thrilled by it. Everybody I know who has read it has loved it. But there's a whole world out there full of angry people who are against anything and anyone who doesn't completely agree with them. We had this in, uh, recently where somebody was standing on the street um, warning us that we were going to hell. and. Uh, these things happen. You're going to find a lot of people who, since they can't answer my logic, they're going to get very angry. The launch of the Italian version of Revelations of Christ, I don't suppose it will be at the Vatican, but it may be in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect that after a while there will come a backlash. Nothing big or important comes without that. Think of Christianity. For the first years it was okay, but after a while they began to realize what they were up against. This is a potent message, don't kid yourselves. This requires a revamping of all your belief system. And I do think that you're going to find persecution. I would like you to understand so that you can be strong and stand firm in yourselves. Because remember that theme song of ours, walk like a man even though you walk alone. 
And if the whole world is against you, if you know this is true, then stand by that. I don't know how soon it will happen, but I'm sure it will happen. This is the nature of human beings. If they can't agree, they shout and persecute. I expect this. I want you to be prepared for it because it won't be easy. But on the other hand, every persecution we have undergone has only made us stronger. And personally, I'm perfectly happy. I, we used to say that we joke that the launch would be followed by a lynch, and I was perfectly ready for it, but I didn't think it would happen so soon. But I wouldn't be surprised if I were martyred. It doesn't matter to me at all. I'm not afraid of anything. But sooner or later, that's going to be something that will give you, have to stiffen your spines. I think so, I know so. And uh, what we need to do, I think this book that I've just finished, Revelations of Christ, proclaimed by Paramahansa Yogananda, is in many ways the most important book I've written. The Gita, yes, but for the long run. For now, this book will make people to realize, I want this. This is the reality I'm seeking. This is what Christ was all about. The teachings make such common sense that I don't think anybody can argue with it. That's why I say, if reason forsakes them, they will only be able to shout. It's, to me, it's something to be quite free and easy about. I say I'll see a few concerned faces, and it concerns me too, but remember, to seek God is not a picnic. Master said to me, seeking God is martyrdom. And what is the thing that we have to martyr? Our egos, our identification with this little personality and body. We are not this. The infinite Lord has taken all these forms and we are like little slivers of glass reflecting his light but our very consciousness is not our own. He had nothing to create the universe out of except his own consciousness. And we must, sooner or later, realize that he is who we are. That's a sort of scary thought in the beginning. You think, but, 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 but I will... <laughs> you have to reach the point where you say, okay, God, it's yours, it's not mine. And the wonderful thing is that when you really feel that, there's a lot of freedom that comes. You feel that you don't really cling to anything. And, well, I know that if I had been told the uh, difficulties of algebra when I was five years old, I might have run screaming down the hallway. <laughs> but when I reached that level, it was fine. And so in the beginning, the thought that you've got to give up the ego may be a terrifying thing. By the time you reach that point of realizing that it's all he, it becomes bondage. I've told this story before how one time I went into Upper Ayodhya and I looked at all the trailers around. This was in the mid-70s. And I thought, I did all this. A few years ago there was nothing and now there's light. And then the thought came to my mind, do you like that thought? And I, th my answer was, no, I don't. It's too limiting. I'd rather just think that it happened, not why keep referring this burden back to me. And I've never had that thought again. He did it, you did it, I, just leave me out of it. But you will find that the less you think I did it, the more you realize he was the doer of everything. There is a great sense of freedom in that. That, uh, um, well, when you realize that, then you understand that God is you. And when what I would like to see all of you aspire to at least, as Master said, aspire at least to the state of Jivan Mukta, which is that state when there is no sense of ego, you're completely free, you're in Nibbikapa Samadhi, but you still have the past karmas to work out, that's no problem. Because once you're free, that doesn't bother you anyway. You don't really care if you have to come back or not because you come back in freedom. Reach that state when you realize that he is everything. But the marvelous thing, and this is something I point out in my um, revelations of Christ, 
that you never really lose yourself because in omniscience there is always the memory that you were Joe or James or Jean or John or whatever, Jan or whatever. You were so a long, dramatic series of incarnations until finally you realized it was God who did all those things and passed through all those lifetimes. And each life is a fantastic drama and adventure. Think of a boy who's born on the right side of the tracks. And he marries, he gets a job because his parents' influence get him that job. He rises quickly because the boss is a friend of his father. He marries the boss's daughter. He inherits the presidency of the company. He settles down in the boss's house when he dies. And everything is beautiful. Wouldn't you be so bored? No. If he's born on the wrong side of the tracks and he has to struggle and struggle and finally get a job as a journeyman in the beginning and comes slowly upward and after a great deal of effort reaches exactly the same goal. Then you put the book down and you say, oh, what a great story. Well, that's what it's like. You have to go through all these lifetimes, so many dramas, so many disappointments, so many tragedies, so many ups and downs. But in the end, when you come out of it, unscathed indeed, because nothing can scathe your soul, and when you come out of that, you suddenly look back with gratitude. You think, what a great story. And every human being has that final denouement of discovery of what a wonderful thing it was that all this time God was always there, loving him, urging him, wanting to wake up. And finally he did. Why waste time? That's what it's all about. When you finally discover God, I mentioned this, I think, in one of my recent talks, that they say that uh, in the Indian scriptures that God created himself so that he might enjoy himself through many. Well, there's no joy in the suffering. There's no joy in the death of cancer and all the tragedy that people go through. But there's a lot of joy, in fact, incredible joy, when you finally get out of it. St. Jean Vianney, said, if you only knew how much God loves you, you would die for joy. What a wonderful thing to say. What a f wonderful thing to believe. He loves you more than you could possibly love yourself, because he is all love itself. So, Etananda, let us always place God first. Survival is a secondary consideration. Success is a secondary or a ter tertiary, whatever, consideration. Finding God, pleasing God, doing his will, even at the cost of seeming failure, this is what it's really all about. He is a victor who comes out of this life loving God and saying, God, I want only you. I want nothing else. Otherwise, it'll just be one more up in a series of ups and downs. And what's the end of that? To go on struggling through this, this, uh, tornado of life, I don't think it's worth it. I think I've had it, and I hope you feel that way too. I remember when I was a boy, and I was so desperate. I was a young man, and I was so desperate to know what it's all about. When I found the autobiography of a yogi, that was it. I took the next bus across the country to Los Angeles. I want to see everybody have that kind of determination. Don't ever let that goal become dim in your life because of wanting this or being disappointed at that or not liking the way this person has treated you. Actually, I think that it would be a great benefit to allow people to mistreat you and not care. That's freedom. How can they hurt you? They can hurt your ego, yes. They can insult your ego. They can't insult your soul. They're only insulting themselves if they do. But be free in your heart and know that he is the only reality that's worth looking for. Everything else is a temporary thing. So in the future, yes, I do think there will be difficulties. I don't suppose I'll escape them, but I'm old enough to escape most of them. And uh, 
you'll have to carry on. But I, I hope that whatever little bit of courage I've shown in my life will have rubbed off onto you. Because, yes, it's a struggle. It's not easy to find God, and He throws every possible obstacle in your way to make sure, do you really want me, or do you want this comfort, or that, that safety, or whatever? If you say that no matter what, I am yours, you will find that at the end of every test there is His joy and His love. So yes, all those years of lawsuits and so on, they weren't pleasant, but they didn't bother us. I'd like to see that whatever tests come, and there must be tests, you can't grow without them. It would be lovely if they would go away, but they don't seem to, so we might as well make the best of it. Remember, His love is always there. A saint is a sinner who never gave up. No matter how many times you fall, get up and say, I will. Master said you will, you, 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 God will never let you, never let you fall as long as you keep trying. If you say, I'm finished, then you'll be finished for this life. But you still have to keep coming back to it. Why waste all those lifetimes now that you're awake to the need for God, the need for truth? Why not make this your, your vow in this life? I will find him if he allows me to, but I will give myself completely to him. Let him take care of the rest. So in the future, I think Ananda will undergo many transformations. It may be that we'll go out and spread this message everywhere. It's not so easy to be a leader. We have to look hard before we find enough people to, who have that quality. One thing that I've always insisted on is that leaders should not be those who want to lead, but those who are willing to as a service to others. And those are the leaders we have, and I pray that it will always be so. But it's not so easy to understand. Leadership is not important. My position is no more important than that of any gardener or whatever. But it's a position of service. And if you have that talent, then it's very worthwhile to use it. We need leaders of that type. We need people to send to different communities as we start them. So that's a problem we've had all along. Thank God we have some very good leaders, and uh, I'd like to see more and more of that. But I'd like you all to take a sense of responsibility. This is your community. You must make of it what it will be. I'm going to India. I will be there for some time. My 60th year of discipleship begins in September, and I hope to come back here not only for the 40th anniversary of Ananda, but for the 60th anniversary of my discipleship, which happened to be the same year. So next year, if God wills, I'll be able to. My body is always a question, but I must say, with God's grace and your help, I'm going back an awful lot better than I came. So we'll see. And. Uh, I think I've answered the questions I wanted to answer. I haven't asked all the, answered all the questions you wanted to answer, but <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to keep on that one theme. Remember, it isn't any specific goal that we need to work towards. It's the direction. And that direction should be more and more harmony, more and more inner peace, more and more love for God, more and more service of others. Think of the needs of others. Master said, give me thyself that I may give thee to all. That is the greatest prayer. Pray to God that he come to you that you might be a servant to other people. I have never thought of myself as teaching or leading or doing any of the things that people might expect of me in my position. I've always thought I'm sharing with friends. I'm not a teacher. But what I know, I just want to share with people. It's so wonderful, why keep it to myself? And the, um, the service as a leader, I never think of myself as leading. 
I said, if you like what I give you, let's do it together. That's what it's all about. Let Ananda always have that spirit and it will thrive and become what it is already, a shining light in this world. To be truthful, and I don't think I'm out of, out of line in saying such a thing, I think Ananda is the most important thing happening on this planet. I don't see any other thing that is offering that kind of help. Politics, political changes, they don't change people. Can you show a community? You know, my idea has always been that to tell people what is good, to have rules and regulations to make them that way, that's not the answer. But when people can see a group of people who can live with joy, harmony, kindness, this is quite extraordinary. All you have to do is look at a sitcom on television, how people are shouting and screaming and getting angry. You don't see that here. And it's very unusual. And the reason we take it for granted is that it's so normal. But what we are here to help people to see is that it's reasonable and it's normal to live like this. As people see us all over the world, they feel they can do the same. It's easier for them. So be shining lights to the world because God wants you to, as Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see his good works and glorify your, your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Be his channels consciously. Don't try to hog it all for yourselves. Realize that there's a hungry world out there and we are the vanguard of this movement of light that is coming into the world. There's a great battle between darkness and light right now. Let us, let us use swords of discrimination and flashlights of love and let us fill the world with that joy. Joy to all of you.